Dr. Ni earned her uh, biology degree in Peking University, China. Um, she did a PhD in cell biology in the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And then her postdoctoral in developmental biology in California Institute of Technology. And today she is with us at Georgia Tech. So please join me in welcoming Professor. Do you think you can turn that on? Yeah, so um, I'll talk about basically two perspectives uh, in our way to try to understand how neuroclast cell migration is uh, controlled or is regulated. One is from the cytoskeletal control, uh, and that is actually also linked to the cell matrix interactions. And uh, so we have a little bit more data uh, in the study of the cytoskeleton control. We'll have a, we're basically just studying some, several projects uh, exploring how the cell matrix interactions also influence the migration of neuroclast cells. So um, before we uh, go into neuroclast migration, I would like to give you some brief backgrounds of uh, why we think neuroclast will be a good model to study and why we're interested in that. And you can see this is a mouse embryo, and all the neuroclast cells are labeled in green. So you can see that, um, so neuroclast cells, they are actually, by name of neuroclast, they are actually born at the borders of the neural plate. So the neural plate in the early developing embryo is basically a sheet of uh, uh, epithelium tissue, and then they will rose up, just like a, if you fold a paper, and it rose up to form a neural tube, and that will give rise to the uh, uh, brains and the spinal cords later in the embryo, in the animal. And the neuroclast actually resides in this lateral borders of the neural plate. And when, as the neural plate falls to form a neural tube, they are at this uh, sort of the dorsal ridge of the neural tube. And that's why it is called a neuroclast. And then afterwards, they will actually delaminate from the neuroepithelium and migrate to lots of tissues. I can see it populates large, lots, of populate, lots of areas in the, in the head, in the craniofacial region and it will give rise to the jaws in the craniofacial region, for example, and it's one of the vertebrae innovatives so that we can, have a, we can have jaws and we can bite, we can become predators. And it can also give rise to lots of other tissues throughout the embryo. For example, they forms lots of uh, connective tissues in the heart that forms the different septums and valves in the heart, a, 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 like innervates the gut and forms the neurons in the gut and can, uh, give, uh, give rise of the uh, enteric nervous system. It also migrates everywhere into the surface uh, of, the, of the animal to form the pigment cells in the, in the animal. So they are highly migratory, and that makes a very important uh, 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 subpopulation for us to really study how this diverse uh, and extensive migratory behaviors are regulated in a living animal. And uh, consistently, because they give rise to all these different tissues, if anything went wrong, they will lead to uh, some uh, defects or disease. For example, they give rise to, like, well, we know that uh, uh, up to one third of all of the congenital birth defects are neuroclast related. And that includes lots of the craniofacial anomalies, such as cleft palate and heart uh, malformations, such as subtle defects. There are also, uh, there's also several neuroclast related tumors, such as uh, glioblastoma, neoblastoma, and melanoma. So uh, there's also lots of uh, syn syndromic defects, such as DeGeorge syndrome, Charge syndrome, uh, uh, treacher collins syndrome, et cetera. And all of these diseases actually are categorized as a neurochristophy. So there's l a, a large number of uh, defects and diseases related to neuroclast. And so we feel that understanding how neuroclasts are regulated will also shed light on how these diseases are developed and may um, help people to develop cures for those uh, diseases and defects. So, um, of course, there are many aspects that we can study in neuroclast cells from the proliferation, the differentiation, 
the migration and uh, neocrest, I did mention, is also a multipotent stem cell, so there are also people studying from that perspective. And to us, we are very interested in understanding really the migratory behaviors of neocrest cells because it's really dynamic and it's actually pretty complex when you think about cells actually migrating in a developing embryo, so the ground they are traveling on is also constantly moving and remodeling. So I'll give you some sense of how that went. And this is a frog embryo, and the neocrest cells are actually, actually uh, labeled in green. So you can see it's actually migrating very rapidly and uh, in a very dynamic ma manner into the branchial arches. So they will later populate the craniofacial cartilage, and also there are some posterior, uh, like a, a trunk neocrest cells also migrating out as a, like a sending out tracks down. So it's a very dynamic process, and we want to understand more about how this, uh, uh, how neocrest cells choose different paths to migrate and how their migration behaviors are regulated. So um, my lab basically studied this process uh, from three different perspectives. One, is the, one of them is to study this from the transcriptional control to see how the transcription of uh, some neuro neocrest specific genes uh, turn on this uh, migratory uh, program and make them highly migratory. Another is to really look at the cytoskeletal, cytoskeletal control to see how neuroquest cells really very uh, um, uh, establish this very efficient migration directly interacting with the migratory machinery in the cell, which is the actin cytoskeleton. And uh, lastly, we're also looking at how the cell matrix uh, interactions are controlled in neuroquest cells because that's also a very important uh, aspect uh, for during cell migration uh, that the cells need to adapt to local environment and change its polarity or send different protrusions and uh, really uh, 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 decide where to go in a very complex uh, microenvironment. So today I will talk a little bit of uh, one recent work on um, uh, neurocrest cells in the actin cytoskeleton, regulating the actin cytoskeleton, and then talk about several directions that we're planning to go in uh, understanding how cell matrix interactions are, uh, are controlled in neurocrest cells. Okay, so the first uh, will be this um, um, uh, how the actin cytoskeleton are controlled uh, in neurocrest cells. And this is uh, a movie showing you the actin filaments uh, of uh, migrating neurocrest cells. So you can see it's actually a, a very dynamic process. The, the actin filaments are assembled and um, it rapidly sort of, <laughs> I don't know why it stops, uh, rapidly moves around uh, within the cell. Yeah, so we want to understand how this is controlled. And we actually have lots of uh, background uh, in, uh, knowledge gained from cell culture studies or uh, yeast studies. So we actually, people have identified up to 100 uh, actin binding proteins or actin uh, cytoskeletal regulators that are really involved in different process during the organization of actin cytoskeleton. For example, there's the bundlers, which is really involved in the forming uh, some like a, 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 a filopodia type of protrusions or the um, uh, branch, uh, uh, the uh, involved in branch formations that are really important in the uh, filopodia type of protrusion formation. And of course, the actin filaments are assembled in one direction and disassembled from the other end. And there's lots of uh, uh, cross-linkers uh, uh, that links actin filaments to the membrane or to the, uh, uh, to the cell cortex and, and to different uh, other strands of uh, actin filaments. So um, our hypothesis is that neuroquest cells uh, develop a, 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 a strategy to really utilize those different actin regulator proteins uh, to really very f achieve a very efficient and very dynamic uh, uh, control of their cytoskeleton because we know the actin cytoskeleton is really the force generating machinery uh, for the cells to achieve uh, to, to achieve migratory, uh, to, to achieve their uh, motility in that, in a sense that neurocrest cells, uh, any cells in particular, uh, they will extend protrusions towards one direction, thus through the uh, cross-linking and bundling as well as the polymerization of actin filaments that will push the membrane of a of cell towards one direction. And then they will form uh, uh, focal adhesions with, uh, that anchors them to the matrix or to the neighboring cells. And then that's something they can hold on to, and then they will form stress fibers, for example, to really pull the back of the cell forward, okay, the rear of the cell forward. And this is really how the cells uh, utilize to, uh, during their migration. 
And I, our hypothesis is neuroclast cells utilize this more efficiently in the other cells, and we are thinking maybe they use some different or specific actin regulators to control this uh, coordination, it coordinated events. And indeed, we actually find several uh, neuroclast specific uh, 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 actin regulators, and we think they maybe play a role to really uh, mediate neuroclast cells to achieve a very dynamic uh, um, uh, uh, cell migratory behavior. And today I'm going to talk to you about one of the story, and which is an uh, effector protein for CDC42. So we all know CDC42 is one of the major uh, cytoskeleton or cell motility regulators uh, among the family of a row, uh, uh, a row family of small GTPases in, along with the row, and rec, uh, uh, row A and REC1. Okay, so um, CDC42 is actually very important in the polarity of cells as well as for the protru uh, like a cell protrusion formation in a diverse context. And uh, consistently, you can see that CDC42 is actually expressed basically universally in the frog embryo. So the frog, uh, uh, they are like at uh, different stages. This is during the stage when your crest is about to form. And then this is the stage that neuroclast cells has migrated. And this is the stage much later on that the craniofacial structures has, uh, are being formed. And you can see that uh, CC42 is actually uh, expressed quite universally throughout these tissues. But there is four uh, 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 effector proteins for CDC42 in vertebrates. And they are actually only expressed in vertebrates, make, which also make us think that maybe these uh, effector proteins for CDC42 basically co-involved with neuroclasts. So neuroclast is also vertebrate innovative. So that they sort of co-evolve in neuroclast cells and really help them to uh, achieve their uh, activities in vertebrate tissues. Okay, so there are four of them, and then you can, f we're focusing on this one, CDC42 effector protein one, or sometimes we refer to as SEP1, in that it's very highly expressed in neuroclast cells in the early stage of uh, embryonic uh, development. So at the, this early stage, this is actually the neuroplate border. When we talk about uh, the neuroplate is not, for, uh, is not folding yet, so they are actually aligns uh, the, the lateral uh, regions of the neuroplate. And then later on, they start to migrate, and they, they populate this uh, migratory neuroclast cells as they migrate down the cranial uh, 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 pharyngeal arches. Okay, so um, so we fo focus our study to really uh, look at how what's the role of this uh, CDC42 effector protein one in neuroclast cell migration. And first of all, we took a loss of function approach just to see if we knock it down, does the neuroclast cell migration are affected? Mm -hmm. Right. So. Um, we take advantage of the, uh, the frog embryos in that is they are very easy to work with. Uh, so we, first of all, they fertilize externally, and we can have, uh, have a good batch, a large batch of embryos that develop synchronized, uh, in a synchronized manner. Uh, secondly, that uh, like, uh, they have a very good fate map. Like a uh, first division basically is always a symmetric division along the dorsal midline. So then we can target one side of the embryo and then use the other embryo as an internal control. And uh, so this is what we do. Like, uh, for example, the bottom half of the embryos are actually injected, and it's traced by a linear tracer, so it gives you this uh, red, uh, red dot, while the uh, upper half of the embryos are actually uninjected. So we can see that uh, at early stages, the expression of this uh, SOX10 is one of the uh, neuroquest marker. Are, uh, so we use, uh, th this is the in situ of this uh, SOX10 uh, uh, RNA. We use it as a marker to label neuroclast cells. So you can see at the early stage, when neuroclast cells are specified, the expression of SOX10 is really unchanged. So you can see, uh, observe a bilateral symmetric expression of SOX10, meaning that uh, neuro, uh, SEP1 is actually not required for neuroclast specification. But then at a later stage, you can see that those are lateral views of the same embryo, the uninjected half and the injected half. You can see that uh, unlike controls, where the injected half also the neuroclast cells migrate pretty well down the branchial arches, the uh, sub one receiving uh, neuroclast cells, they actually don't migrate as far comparing to the unilateral uh, uninjected controls. Well, this can be largely rescued by adding more of the uh, sub one RNA back into the embryo. Okay, so from that, uh, so our next question is uh, whether this effect is uh, cell autonomous to the neuroclast cells, whether it's uh, because we inject, of course, we target the region that will give rise to neuroclast cells, but then uh, inevitably there will be other neighboring cells. So we inject an A cell stage in one of the dorsal animal cells, and that cells will give rise to neuroclast as well as some neural tissues as well as some other surrounding tissues. So um, to do that, we actually uh, use, do a transplantation experiment 
which we would uh, label one half of the embryo together with the morpholino, for example, and then isolate this uh, cranial neurocrest tissue before they become uh, migratory. And then we replace that into a host embryo where we remove the same tissue and then replace with this uh, labeled tissue. And now we can see this labeled neurocrest cells, how they migrate in the host embryo. Okay, and this way we can really get a pure population of a cranial neurocrest cells, not uh, worrying about the, the, like a, the tissues next to the cranial neurocrest, whether they receive the morpholino or not. And by this experiment, we can see that uh, when control uh, uh, graft migrates pretty nicely into the branchial arches, and then they can segregate into this uh, three or four migratory streams into the branchial arches. Uh, the sep one morpholino is receiving uh, uh, grafts. They don't migrate as far. Sometimes they migrate a little bit, but usually they don't migrate as far, and also they don't segregate into very distinct migratory streams. So uh, showing you that uh, the migration is really, uh, uh, well, the, the migratory neurocrest cells really need sep one in them to really uh, assist them to migrate properly. And this can be largely rescued when you add a sep one uh, RNA back into those grafts, okay? So we also um, sort of um, uh, measured the distance of the graphs, uh, how far the graphs migrate in along the, uh, the entire ventral dorsal ventral aspect of the embryo, as well as how many uh, um, uh, uh, distinct streams they, they segregate into and, char and characterize that here. So you can see that both the distance of migration and the uh, uh, number of migratory streams are significantly reduced by the sub one morpholino. Okay, so, um, so that tells us that uh, SEP1 is required in neurocrest cells to migrate properly, but then we next want to understand how, how, how does SEP1 control this process, right? So uh, we want to really observe the cell behaviors more closely and more directly. And for that, we actually um, utilized uh, in vitro culture assay. So one good thing about in vitro culture in, uh, of the neurocrest cells, or at least the frog neurocrest cells, in that they actually uh, maintains lots of the intrinsic uh, uh, um, characteristic or features in that although we isolate them, isolate this cranial neural crest, like just as we do the transplantation experiment, uh, instead of uh, plating, uh, grafting them back into another host embryo, now we just directly plate them on fibronectin cultured, uh, cover glass. And you, uh, uh, coated cover that glass. You can see that the, um, the tissues actually are not just like a, a, a regular cell cultures and then just form a, a uniformed layer of cells. They actually still maintain some structure. For example, this is sort of the core of the, uh, uh, the explants. And then you can see the cells are migrating down and then they actually segregate, uh, like a not as organized, but then they segregate into several streams showing us that probably they have some uh, differential uh, adhesive ab uh, ability uh, properties in them so that they will naturally uh, segregate uh, to, uh, from each other. And this is a movie showing that you can see the uh, explants will segregate into several lobes. It's uh, probably a little bit um, faint here, but then you can really, uh, but then this allows you to see the behaviors and the morphology of the cells are much better. Okay, so using these methods, we are actually looking at how the neurocast cells behave um, in the control and the morpholino uh, or the knockdown conditions. So this is now the same explant now with the actin filaments labeled. <laughs> There's something wrong with the um, movie. Let me play it again. So this is the actin filament uh, labeling of uh, control cells. So you can see that the, <laughs> the cells actually move very dynamically. You can see the enrichment of actin filaments in the leading edge of the cell and, uh, well, let, let's play it again. And if you follow one particular cell, you can see that uh, the cells, the, the actin filaments will be uh, enriched in the area. And then as that protrusion is uh, fully extended and about to withdraw, the actin filaments actually rapidly re, uh, relocalize to other areas of the cell. So it's a very dynamic and very complex process. But then in contrast, when we knock down step one uh, with the morpholino, and now remember this time, we actually use a much lower dose, like a less than half of the dose we used in the, like a, injecting the whole mount embryos so that we want to see a moderate effect. And we see that a very, uh, still uh, we observed very dramatic defects in that the cells actually, uh, they are much rounder and also the, the actin filaments, they basically bundles up uh, in rings, sort of a parallels to the cell cortex, and they're sort of a sh uh, only shifting in a wave-like manner. Let me play this again. So you can see they really 
form just <laughs> uh, bundles of rings, and then they don't really make very uh, obvious philopodia or lamidipodia type of protrusions. And uh, for that, and we sort of have some clues of why that happens. For example, we know that those, uh, those uh, um, uh, well, let me play it again, and I can point to you. So they don't form the lamidopodia or philopodia type of protrusions, but sometimes they form this, uh, like a bulging areas, um, which is called membrane blobs. Oops. Ah. Oh. I don't know what's wrong. So sometimes the membrane are pushed out a little bit, and so it's have a, 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 a the so-called blabs. Come on. Did you see some of those? Ah, yeah, <laughs> oh, is it? Yeah. So if I don't touch the pointer, okay. <laughs> okay. So you can see, like in areas like this, they will have a small kind of a protrusions of the membrane, but it's kind of a, uh, uh, it's really different from the, the, the other type of protrusions. So they kind of uh, have this uh, wavy membranes kind of a blowing, blowing out and uh, in. So that's called membrane blabs. And we know uh, partly what caused the membrane blabs in that, for one thing, the, the actin filaments failed to attach firmly to the uh, cell cortex or the membrane so that they couldn't stabilize the, uh, the protrusion. On the other hand, there is a higher pressure, uh, cell cellular pressure, so that when there is a leak, like uh, the actin cortex doesn't bound tightly to the cell membrane, and then there is the cytoplasmic flow, and then they will push the membrane out a little bit, and then that would just really uh, also uh, is a very dynamic process. It will be in and out. Okay, so um, so before we characterize more about, no, yes. uh, um, so we're going to try to understand what uh, really mediates the formation of this membrane blast. So before that, we actually characterize. Uh, the, the organization of actin filament. So we believe that, uh, first of all, the, the protrusion, the type of protrusions actin, uh, uh, actin filaments make in those cells are different. And then we actually look at the, uh, the profiles of those actin filaments in the cells. And we can see, like this is really uh, over time of uh, individual cells. So you can see that, for example, they form like, a, like the, in the protrusion area, like a, the protrusion reach areas, like the size of the cell, they have a higher amount of uh, actin filaments. And also the cell is actually migrating, this, cell, this particular cell is migrating towards the left. Well, the sub one cells, they actually also have a higher level and it's an even higher level of, of uh, actin filaments around the cell cortex, which forms that rings of bundles but then they don't really move as much. And you can see this uh, blabs forming sometimes when they have a double peak. And then uh, while well, there's much lower actin filaments or less amount of actin filaments in the center of the cell comparing to the controls. And um, yeah, which is also reflected here when we um, uh, profiled lots of the intensity of actin filaments uh, across many different cells and normalized them. You can see that uh, the, the control cells has a uh, high level of actin filaments on the side, and then also some actin filaments in the middle. Well, the, the sub one morpholino cells, they don't have much actin filaments in the middle, but they, all of the actin filaments are enriched in the bundles uh, around the um, cell cortex. So, um, so we think that sub one probably play a role in uh, either uh, promoting the formation of a laminipodia or philopodia type of protrusions or preventing the formation of a membrane blobs. And we actually look at the expression of a, well, I should have just used this, right? Uh, we, have, uh, we look at the expression of an actin filament, uh, sorry, sub-1 in the, in the, in the neuroclast cells. Um, I hope you can see. So this is the, the uh, fusion protein of a sub-1 in the, in the cell, just a, a very uh, uh, zoomed in. So you can see, first of all, the, actin, uh, the, the sub one is actually expressed in a polarized manner. So it's, um, come on, oops, oh, I have <laughs> very sorry about this. Um, Yeah, so you can see that they have this uh, sort of fragmented pieces, and then they actually uh, 
when in the in even, even the control cell, sometimes they want to form this membrane blobs by maybe uh, temporarily have this uh, detachment from the actin cortex to the mem uh, to the cell membrane. But then actin, uh, well, the sep one actually sort of uh, will rush to that area and protect the cells from forming the uh, the membrane blobs. Can you see that? Yeah. So um, so so that's something we think that maybe sep one plays a role in really inhibiting the formation of membrane blobs. So uh, before we go into that more, uh, we actually want to really characterize how the motility of uh, neurocryte cells are uh, impaired by loss of a SEP1. And we're thinking maybe we should just look at the very mechanical sort of a basis for cell migration, which is the cells to really migrate efficiently. They really need to form attachment to the matrix and then to uh, really power their movements by pulling on the matrix. So we look, come on. <laughs> so we actually look at two things. One is to really look at the, the cell adhesion that directly formed between the neurocryte cells and the, um, the extracellular matrix, which is called focal adhesions. Okay, so uh, first of all, we took two approaches. One is to really look at the uh, formation of fo focal adhesions, and this is really immunohistochemistry uh, staining of a phosphorylated tyrosine, which labels the focal complex. So you can see in control and uh, sub one complex uh, 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 explants, so you can see that uh, in controls, the focal adhesions actually formed in very neatly organized arrays even like sometimes inside. So you can see this because the, the neurocryte cells in frog, they actually um, are, uh, uh, forms a sort of the uh, staggered manner. So it's sort of like a scales. So the leader cells and the fuller cells basically ride on the leader cells. So you can see the laminopodia of one of the cells sort of uh, underneath another cell. Or like in the periphery, you can see the uh, laminopodia is formed by the cells on the periphery of these explants. So they have like a very neatly uh, uh, organized, aligned uh, focal adhesions and uh, uh, really directing the cells to move towards one direction. Well, in the sep one Muflino explants, you can see two, two different things. First of all, sometimes there's a, a, a focal adhesions formed in the inside of the cell. This is one cell sort of isolated from the explant. And you can see that there's a focal adhesions formed inside the cell. And lots of times they do have a full cohesions formed along the periphery of the cell, but then the organization are much messy. They don't really align very neatly uh, uh, sort of uh, re uh, next to each other. So, uh, so we think that they pr probably have some several defects. First is in the alignments of uh, full cohesions. The other thing is the turnover of full cohesions because we actually know that uh, CDC42 and REC1 plays a role in the turnover of full cohesions. So maybe uh, the turnover is also affected in that the focal adhesions remains in the center of the cells because the, as the cell progress forward, the, the, the previous formed focal adhesions needs to recycle back to the front of the cells to form new focal adhesions. Okay, so there are several things that might uh, have been uh, wrong. But then at the same time, we know that the focal adhesions tend to align with the, the direction of the force. So they are actually, there is a very dynamic uh, sort of feedback process in that the focal adhesions, they are not just formed by some mechanisms and states there. They actually are constantly uh, organized and aligned by the uh, force that they're interacting with. So to really directly look at the, 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 how, the force, uh, how the cells exert force to the matrix during their migration, we f performed the traction force microscopy experiment. So, um, so this is in collaboration with uh, Dr. Curtis lab in physics. And uh, so we look at how control cells and sub one mufalino cells uh, um, exert w uh, uh, force, apply force to the matrix. So basically what we did is to, apply, uh, to plant cells on a matrix of a hydrogel, and in the hydrogel, in the surface layer, layer of the hydrogel, there's fluorescent, fluorescent beads embedded in there. So we want to, uh, and, uh, to measure or study the traction force the cells apply to the hydrogel, which is reflected by the sort of the strain energy the hydrogel absorbed from that cell, and which can be measured or calculated by measuring the displacement of those of fluorescent beads uh, in the gel, uh, plus with the, uh, the, the stiffness of the gel, like we can calculate the, the strain energy the, the gel is actually absorbing. Okay, so this is uh, a control cell, and uh, I want to orient you that the yellow arrows actually tells you where the strings are and, uh, and how big are the strings, and the, the red areas, like the highlight areas where there's a really uh, uh, higher string energies there. Okay, let me play this. <laughs> 
Okay, so you can see during the migration of this uh, control cell, and also there's lots of cells migrating upward. So the, all of the uh, the high strain energy really uh, localized to the cell protrusions. And if you observe carefully, you can see that the arrows always point. Uh, let me think, uh, point towards the cell body, okay? So because the protrusions are pulling on the matrix for the cells to migrate, okay? So that's the same for this uh, individual cell as well as for those cells migrating upwards. So you can see the arrows are pointing down and they are, the cells are really pulling on the matrix to migrate towards one direction. So in contrast, um, this is the mufalino cells. So you can see, first of all, the cells, of course, adopt different morphology, but also the string uh, the strain energy really localized to the center of the cells. So you can see, that, uh, first of all, uh, the, the locations are different. They are not really in the membrane blabs or the, in the periphery of the cell, but rather in the center of the cell. Another thing is that um, the, uh, <laughs> it's pretty, probably too fast, but the, you can see the strain, the arrows, they're actually pointing random uh, orientation. They like, point to different directions uh, at different times. That's sort of a consistent to the focal adhesion uh, analysis we uh, performed in that there's more focal adhesions formed in the center of the cell and also the orientations are not as well aligned compared to controls. So we uh, also measured the, uh, or counted the different type of cells or the cells with different morphology from different genotype uh, or different uh, treatments. So you can see that the controls, uh, under the control condition, most of the cells uh, spread pretty well and then uh, a few of them actually also displace the blabbing behavior, while the subpoint mofolino will lead to most of the blabbing behaviors of the cells. And we actually measured the strain energy under each individual cells and try to see whether there's a difference in the, in the, uh, the magnitude of the strain energy. And what we see is actually, regardless of the genotype, basically, either it's a control or it's a mofolino cells, as long as they, be, they display different, uh, similar behaviors, the strain energy are actually uh, not, sig not significantly different. But then it's really uh, when the cells dis display a spreading behavior, they have uh, displayed where they exert higher string energy uh, versus the cells that are having an intermediate or uh, a blabbing behavior. Okay? Yeah, so, so with that, we show. I have to go faster. <laughs> uh, with that, we, we believe that uh, the, the sub one plays an important role in mediating. The, uh, the, the organization of actin filaments, both in the formation of different type of protrusions and also for uh, the focal contacts or focal adhesions that uh, the cells form uh, with the actin filaments to really uh, uh, interact with the matrix to migrate ex efficiently. So um, as, uh, since CDC for, uh, this uh, CDC42 effector protein one is an uh, effector protein for CDC42, and that's how they were identified. They were identified through a yeast to hybrid system uh, that combines to CDC42. Okay, so we next, uh, the next question we want to ask is how it interacts with CDC42 to maintain this, uh, to regulate these processes, and how, uh, how, how they um, regulate the activity or uh, assist CDC42. And we know CDC42 is a major uh, player in uh, establishing cell polarities. And we want, so the question is how do they work together and how they, uh, um, how, how they uh, uh, interact with CDC42. So, um, so we first really look at the, the localization of a CDC42 and a SEP1. So you can see that, so the CDC42 is labeled in green and the SEP1 is labeled in red. So you can see the yellow area is the, the area where the two proteins are co-localized. So you can see like there's some, lots of yellow areas in the per, 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 periphery of the cells or in the protrusions. At the same time, there's lots of uh, red areas actually near the nucleus. So that's um, by, by, uh, described by others as a perinuclear patch or perinuclear region in that they probably form some, well, probably interact with actomyosin to, to maintain the directionality of a cell. Well, in the periphery, they probably promote the protrusions of cells. So we next really uh, perform some functional study trying to understand how the uh, uh, CDC42 and SEP1 in, uh, influence the activity of each other. So this is a control movie showing you the expression of a, a CDC42 in the migrating cells. So um, let me play it again. Okay, so you probably can see that this group of uh, explants are actually migrating towards this direction. So there's a higher level of uh, CDC42 in, this, uh, the, in the leading, ef leading edge of the cell in the direction where the cells are migrating towards. And this is uh, a condition when SEP1 is overexpressed. So you can see that the cells, uh, 
don't, first of all, they don't migrate as much. And also, the cells actually uh, formed lots of protrusions. For example, if you look at this cell, they form protrusions around uh, in every area, every, uh, like uh, around the periphery of the cell. Okay, so they actually uh, lost this polarity of uh, uh, localization in, uh, uh, of this uh, CDC42. Similarly, um, yeah, similarly, when you, um, yeah, similarly, when you knock down SEP1, you can see the cells, of course, they are uh, slightly rounder as well, but then the cell, the, the CD C42 are basically distributed pretty evenly in the cell, and they lost the polarity, and they also lost the formation of uh, different membrane protrusions. So we see that, um, so we know that one of the major functions of uh, CDC42 is really to uh, uh, promote the formation of philopodias, right? So that's the, basically the first study people characterize the function of CDC42. When it's overexpressed, the cells will form like, a, uh, um, like a multiple spikes all around the periphery of the cell. And when CDC42 is lost, they don't form the philopodia protrusions. So similarly, we characterize the number of cell protrusions formed by the cells, and we see that the... the a level of a SEP1 actually also controls this activity or uh, 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 assisting this uh, uh, activity of CDC42 in that when there's higher level of SEP1, the, the cells actually express, uh, make more philopodia protrusions. And when there's less uh, SEP1, they make less protrusions. However, we don't think they, uh, the SEP1 controls the activity of a CDC42 per se, in that, first of all, this uh, SEP1 uh, don't have the GGF uh, activity. It's not a granny exchange, uh, a granny nucleotide exchange factor, so it won't play a role in activating CDC42. And on the other hand, uh, we look at, uh, we directly look at the uh, activity of, uh, <laughs> this is very faint, the activity of, uh, activate, or the, or the activation of a CDC42. So this is a fusion protein uh, with the uh, CDC42 binding site of uh, uh, PAC1, which can only binds to activated CDC42, okay? W uh, can only binds to the GTP bound CDC42, in other words. So you can see this is one migrating cell. So you can see in the leading edge in this protrusions, there's higher level of uh, this uh, activated CDC42. Well, in this, uh, oops. Um, in this uh, cells that control, uh, express sub one morpholino, this, the, the cells, basically express higher, uh, well, express this uh, activated CDC42 basically around the periphery. There's not an obvious polarity. So it seems that, uh, and when we look at this, uh, the, the general level of um, uh, activated CDC42 are not changing, but it's really the localization or the distribution of activated CDC42 are affected. So conversely, we also look at how CDC42 affects the activity of, uh, or the localization of SEP1. So, uh, so the, on the left is the control condition. So you can see that um, uh, uh, the SEP1 is actually expressed both in the perinuclear region or in the cell protrusions. Well, when this um, CDC42 is overexpressed, you can see very interestingly that most of the most of the uh, expression of uh, SEP1 now goes to the cell periphery. You don't see this perinuclear patch anymore and uh, they are all in the, the periphery and at south-south junctions. Conversely, um, conversely, when you uh, knock down CDC42, you see a very, uh, 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 um, see a contrary effect in that most of the SEP1 now goes to the perinuclear region, but not so much in the, in the south periphery. So we actually um, look at the, the, the intensity of SEP1 in across many cells and summarize in this graph. So you can see that, uh, for example, the purple are the control conditions, the, uh, or blue is the, the, the expression of a SEP1 across, a, across the diameter of a cell, so that there is high level in the cell peripheries, but also in this uh, perinuclear patch in the center of the cell. When a CDC42 is increased, you can see a drastic uh, increase in the CDC uh, sub one expression in the cell periphery, but a very low level of CDC42. Uh, sorry, sub one in the cell center, where near the uh, near the nucleus. And in contrast, when CDC42 is knocked down, showed by this red curve, that uh, they don't have much expression in the cell periphery, but most of them were in the cell center. Okay, so so we think that CDC42 probably 
plays a role in balancing the two subpopulations of uh, SEP1. One. one is in the, one, like, because CDC32 itself is actually located to the south periphery, and they probably attract uh, uh, SEP1 to the south periphery at high levels. Well, at low levels, they will freeze up those uh, SEP1, and then they will go to the paranuclear region where there's no CDC42. Okay, so they will d display some CDC42 independent activities. And because the previous movies couldn't really uh, show the, the morphology of the cell, this is just a uh, phylloidine staining uh, uh, of the cells uh, receiving CDC42 morpholino or overexpression of CDC42. <laughs> it's probably very faint again. But you can see that when there's CDC42 morpholino, uh, the CDC uh, sub one localized to the perinuclear regions, and only th there's still some remaining faint regions where there's uh, protrusions that can be formed. So those cells don't form much protrusions. In contrast, those cells that high level CDC three two form lots of protrusions, and uh, the sub one <laughs> co resides in the region where the protrusions are sending out. Okay, so um, for summary of this part, so we show that. Um, uh, this is, uh, actin regulator SEP1 is actually especially re uh, uh, utilized in your cells. It's required for cell migration, uh, for the organization of actin filaments, and also alters the force transmission during cell migration. And they actually influence the cellular localization of each other in that high level of CDC42 will drive high level of uh, cell, uh, uh, SEP1 at the cell protrusions, while low level of CDC42 leads to a high level of uh, perinuclear expression. And we know that this. Um, the cells during active cell migration, they have to constantly uh, switch between a, a protrusive activity to a contractive activity to uh, really uh, maintain a very dynamic and very efficient cell migration. And since this, if we, uh, since that point play a role in both process, and they probably really mediate this uh, uh, rapid adaptation uh, to switch between the two modes, so uh, promotes the cells to migrate very efficiently. So. Um, this is really a long-term goal for this part of the project, that we really want to build up a network understanding how different actin regulators coordinate during the migration of neural crest cells. So we so far studied a few genes in this map, and there's a lot more that we want to uh, incorporate. And uh, hopefully we're hoping that we can utilize now also the mathematic modeling approach to really uh, uh, to, to build up this network in a more sort of a robust and uh, efficient manner. Okay, so <laughs> I readily switch to the second uh, part of the talk, which is to understand the interaction between cell and extra cell, extracellular matrix. So I want to say it's also uh, connected to the actin cytoskeleton uh, uh, regulation in that we know this when the cells form uh, uh, connections with the matrix, they, the, they, to stabilize such connections or uh, the, the adhesions, such as focal adhesions that we just talked about, they need to link to the actin cytoskeleton really to stabilize this uh, interaction and, and that uh, will the, the, actin, the dynamics of actin filaments also feed back onto the, uh, the dynamics of the focal adhesions, for example. So this diagram illustrates several ways of uh, how actin filaments, uh, so, sorry, how the extracellular matrix and the cells can interact with each other. For example, the matrix, of course, they will uh, uh, pr uh, serve as a cushioning or the physical constraints to the cells, so that will, modul uh, that will modulate them, both the migration and also even the proliferation and growth of the cell. And on the other hand, uh, they, lots of time, the matrix will also, uh, say, uh, serve as a reservoir for the growth factors for the cells to respond to. They can either um, titrate the, the ligands or, or growth factors or present the growth factors to the cell, to the receptors on the surface of the cell. On the other hand, the cells also actively feed back to the matrix. For example, they make, uh, they, they make different type of uh, proteases, like a, uh, metal proteases, for example, they will cleave and remodel the extracellular matrix around them so that they can make ways to go to other places. They can also cleave the cell adhesion molecules, for example. And on the other hand, the cells will synthesize those uh, matrix proteins and secrete them so that they are both making or synthesizing the uh, matrix proteins as well as remodeling the matrix. So for this part of the, uh, uh, for this project, so we actually take two approaches. One is a uh, candidate approach, and we actually uh, look at one of the, the proteases, the, the metal proteases uh, number 14, or the transmembrane metal proteases, as a candidate to really understand how that plays a role in your crest migration. And uh, another approach we took is a more exploratory approach, and we want to see how the cell surface receptors are differentially modified at different stage of a neural crest cell migration. Okay, so we don't have uh, as much data in this part of the talk, and um, I'll go through this uh, hopefully faster. Uh, 
So, like the, so this is basically introduction of the macular proteases, and as you know, that they can cleave different matrix proteins or cleave the ligands for different cell surface receptors, and then uh, themselves they usually uh, uh, come in an uh, inactive form, the poor form, and that they need to another active uh, matrix proteases to cleave off this uh, 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 propeptide to become active. So we're focusing on one of the uh, matrix uh, metal protease is called MMP14. And this is the, one of the uh, transmembrane uh, MMP so that they always stays on the cell membrane. Well, not always, but most of the time. And uh, they actually play a role in activating a, bunch of, uh, a number of other uh, MMPs as well. So you can see that it's expressed actually in migrating neural in the early, uh, at the early stage, it actually expressed in the high brain. So you can see it lights up the wrong bimere 3 and wrong bimere 5. But then later on, they also express in the supreme migratory neural and later in the migrating neural as they populate the branchial arches. So we think this might be an interesting um, candidate to study um, neural migration. And indeed, when we knock down MMP14 in a similar approach, uh, as we described earlier, and this is also the SOX10 expression, you can see that I injected site the, the, the uh, neocryst cells migrated further into, bran into the branchial arch while this um, MMP14 injected site don't migrate as much. So uh, this is actually a structure of the MMP14. So we know that it's a transmembrane protein, but the transmembrane domain is here. So they have a very tiny cytoplasmic tail and then a very large extracellular domain with the catalytic domain as well as the PAX domain or the uh, hemo, uh, hemopexin domain. And this is the domain that, uh, maintain, uh, that helps uh, MMP14 to interact with lots of other cell surface proteins like uh, uh, um, uh, CD44 or the TIMP, the uh, tissue inhibitor of, of uh, metal proteases. And that, this interaction really helps the MMP14 to activate other MMPs, such as another very uh, major, num uh, major form of MMP is called MMP2, which is also involved in lots of uh, uh, cancers and disease. So this, uh, the MMP14 will bind with this domain to the, uh, another surface receptor, and then that will recruit uh, MMP2 over and then use the catalytic domain to activate, uh, cleave and activate MMP2. So uh, one, uh, one uh, doubt or one possibility is that MMP14 may help or play a role in neocryst migration by activating MMP2. Okay, so to really confirm that uh, or to, to assess that, we actually used uh, one chemical inhibitor. Uh, this uh, chemical inhibitor actually uh, specifically targets this PAX domain so that uh, people have shown that using this inhibitor, they can inhibit the MMP2 activating activity of MMP14, but not the other activity of MMP14. They can still uh, uh, cleave some matrix of its own and, and perform other signaling uh, activities. And we can see that uh, with the DM DMSO control and the chemical inhibitors, you can see uh, the, the migration of neocrystals is still uh, affected by this, uh, specific, uh, this uh, specific inhibitor, uh, telling us that they probably play both MMP2-dependent and MMP2-independent activities in neocrystal migration. So another way that MMP14 and MMP2 may co cooperate in neurocryst cell migration is that they may express in different tissues. For example, uh, there's been studies showing that MMP2 is actually highly expressed in the pharyngeal mesenchymes in uh, other species that they probably are not really uh, required in neurocryst cells, but required in the neighboring tissues in neurocryst cells uh, to really uh, maintain or uh, facilitate the migration of neurocryst cells. So we performed a... Um, uh, uh, graphing experiments, as we talked, uh, sh uh, mentioned before. And this time, we actually tried both tra strategies. One is to uh, um, uh, express, uh, uh, well, one is to graft control neurocryst cells into an MMP14 morpholino host embryo to see whether MMP14 is required in the surrounding tissues of neurocryst cells. And the other is to graft uh, the MMP14 uh, morpholino expressing neurocryst into a control embryo to see whether it's required in neurocryst cells. So you can see that the control uh, neocryst in the MMP14 host embryos, the, the neocryst grafts can migrate pretty well into the branchial arches, while the MMP14 morpholino neocryst cannot really migrate in the control uh, host embryos, suggesting that MMP14 is really uh, required in the neocryst cells for their migration. So the next thing we want to do is really to see whether MMP2 is required in neocryst or in the surrounding tissues, and maybe in combination, for example, uh, the MMP14 in the neocryst and then the MMP2 in the uh, pharyng uh, pharyngeal or the uh, host embryos, maybe that can really uh, have more uh, synergistic effect in your cross migration. Okay, 
So uh, another thing we, we are wondering about is that because the, the, uh, one of the major activities of MMPs is to cleave the matrix so that in embryo, of course, the, the, the nucleus cells are surrounded by lots of tissue so that they couldn't really migrate away without the, this prote uh, protease activity. But then if they are isolated, then they, are not, they don't have any cellular constraints uh, in their neighborhood, then maybe they don't have any defects. So then we do the X1 culture experiment trying to establish, to assess that. And here we actually used one of the uh, pan MMP inhibitors, which is the preno mestat, that will inhibit MMP2, MMP14, as well as a number of other MMPs. So you can see that in control X1s and the, uh, pino, uh, uh, the, the inhibitor treating neuroquest X1s, they both can migrate pretty well. You see they spread pretty, uh, to a very thin sheet of cells. But then there is a drastic difference in that in control cells, after they migrate in a kind of a continuous, uh, uh, um, coherent sheet for a while, they start, the cell starts to break, a, break apart and they still start to separate into individual cells and migrate further. Well, in this uh, uh, chemical inhibitor treated uh, samples, the cells can spread and they can mi migrate to f uh, further distances when they, they fail to uh, separate from each other. So that tells us maybe EMT, the epithelium to mesenchymal transition is affected. Okay, so we next look at uh, how MMP14 plays a role in this process. So here are the same uh, experiment with control explants, the MMP14 overexpression explants, as well as the MMP14 morpholino explants, uh, at, uh, like a, uh, similar to the sibling stage of uh, neuroquest specification or early migration and late migration stage. So you can see that the control cells from a coherent sheet and start to have cells migrating uh, in, in, as individual cells. The MMP14 overexpression actually promotes these events that the cells start to uh, spread and, and have uh, individual cells migrating off uh, earlier on, and then they actually migrate very far, uh, far distance from the, the X ones. While the MMP4 morpholino X ones also they don't migrate as far, and then they. They, uh, the cells don't uh, separate from each other as much. So it tells us that MMP14 pro probably plays two roles. One is the migration per se, the motility of the cell per se, and also uh, the, the really the, uh, the EMT or the uh, segregation uh, uh, of cells. And uh, next thing we're actually, well, currently we're actually trying to look at different cadherins to see how they modu modulate the activity or the expression of a different cadherins proteins. Maybe that mediates this uh, EMT process. So for a summary of this, um, so we think that MMP14 is required for neuroquest migration, and that can be independent of MMP2, and it also regulates the spreading of the EMT process. So uh, the next question we want to ask is, was the substrate of MMP14 EMT? Uh, for example, we're planning to look at some cadherin uh, uh, molecules first, and then we also want to see how does uh, MMP14 interact with other cell surface molecules, uh, and, and what's the role in the signaling events. And th this is a really interactive um, uh, interaction map of uh, MMP14 with lots of other proteins. You can see they can potentially interact with lots of different proteins. And there's a few things where very interesting. One of them is CD44. It's another cell surface receptor required for lots of the signaling events of uh, MMP14. Uh, S1 in, in, is another transcription factor, very important in your cells cells that we study in a separate project. And uh, also the EGF uh, signaling pathways, uh, where is it? Uh, as MMP14 can actually um, uh, 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 cleave the EF, uh, EGF ligands and then promote the, uh, the RB EGF receptor signaling pathways. And that uh, has something uh, to show to work similarly in your cells and as well as in cancer. Okay, so uh, I'll probably last time to talk about the next two projects. So uh, I'll just mention briefly that we're also uh, um, planning to understand more about how this uh, uh, extracellular matrix uh, controls the migration of neural crest cells, and we know that the holon uh, the carbon hydrates in extracellular matrix, plays important roles in hosting all these different proteic icons. And uh, some of them has been studying neural crest cells to either play an inhibitory role or a permissive role in neural crest cells to migrate into the area. And we want to understand how the level of uh, holon and the receptor, again, is a CD44 on the cell surface. And, and we want to understand how they play a role in the migration of neural crest cells. And another approach <laughs> uh, we, we undertake is really to, end, uh, to look at the uh, glycosylation of the cell matrix receptors because the cell surface receptors uh, are, once they expose the extracellular uh, environment, they all have a highly, uh, glycosyl uh, highly glycosylated and they have a, loss, a bunch of a different uh, uh, size and uh, 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 side chains that they can uh, add. To, to, and this, people believe, will play a role in really the affinity, uh, modulating the affinity of uh, 
uh, of proteins to other uh, cell surface receptors or ligands and other proteins and probably plays a role in the cell adhesion events. And I borrowed this diagram from the cancer research field in that people in cancer research believe that uh, the different cadherins or integrins actually has differential uh, glycosylation at this, uh, in tumor cells comparing to control cells and that probably really uh, changed their affinity to other cell surface receptors. So we did an exploratory approach by MassBack and really look at a, a glycosylation state of, a, of a, a proteins at different stage of over uh, frog development. And we did characterize a few interesting uh, molecules, such as lots of the neurocadherins uh, or neuro uh, cell adhesion molecules, the E cadherins. This is a protocadherins in neurocrats and uh, so mice. Uh, this is another proteases, uh, a bunch of integrins, fibronectin, and this is actually uh, an enzyme that degrades hyaluronic. Uh, so they, their levels are either decrease or increase or sometimes increase and then decrease at different stage of neuroquest development. And that will give us uh, lots of, uh, uh, lots of uh, projects that we can work on to really understand how they, uh, how, how, first of all, how they are expressed and how they, uh, 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 how that correlates to the migration of neuroquest cells. And another thing is then we can really mutate some of the sites f f uh, that uh, are um, uh, glycosylated and see how that affects the migration and the affinity of neuroquest cells to other matrix. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> with that, I would like to thank uh, uh, people in the lab and my collaborators. So Shlomi is a, uh, you see her, him, uh, is a, a QBio uh, PhD student and uh, he, he helped with the analysis of attractional force microscopy that I talked about in the first part. And then uh, Taylor and Megan are undergrads who worked on the uh, uh, MMP14 projects. And Karen and Claire uh, works on another project I haven't have got time to talk about. So we collaborate with Jennifer uh, Curtis lab in physics, uh, with, both with attraction force microscopy and we're planning to uh, work together on the Holoronin project. And uh, Rong, uh, Rong Hu Wu from chemistry helped with the uh, mass spec analysis on the glycosylated sites. And these are collaborators from uh, UCSD who work on another projects. Okay, thank you. Thank you.